All right, thank you everyone for joining us. We're really pleased to see everyone. Uh, we're glad that you can be with us for our first webinar of 2021. Um, today, uh, we'll go through the usual, as I'm sure many of you have already seen before, but for anyone who's not aware, um, we'll be providing a PDF of all of the slides at the end of the presentation um, in the, with the recording. So uh, just keep an eye out for that email when it comes through. So, uh, without further ado, um, let's tell you a little bit about uh, who we have with us. Uh, today we have Michael Hughes, who's coming to us from our London, UK office. We have myself, Tanya Anderson, coming from Vancouver, BC. And of course, you all know, I'm sure, our special guest speaker who's coming to us from New York. Michael, do you want to jump in here and tell us a little bit about Sutron Global? Happy to. Thank you, Tanya. Welcome, everybody. Uh, welcome back to our 2021 uh, program. Um, for those of you that don't know, Sutron Global is a cloud-based library knowledge and information management solution provider dedicated to helping information professionals manage library transformation. The manner and the way in which we're able to do this is seen on the next slide where we have evidence of our solutions that we um, offer and make available to the information professionals with whom we partner. So core to our offering is our library information management system, but increasingly um, we're now being tasked with managing and helping facilitate access to uh, digital assets knowledge management, uh, knowledge assets, skills, and corporate archive material uh, increasingly. So on the next slide, you'll see um, details about um, some of the assistance that is available to people um, in 2021. Uh, this is a reboot of our very successful 2020 program, um, the COVID-19 response package that we put together for information professionals. Um, part of that program is the uh, series of educational webinars, of which this is one, uh, and there will, will be many more. But we also offer financial assistance to those people interested in partnering with us um, with any of those solutions that you saw on the previous screen. So if we just skip forward to the next slide, you'll have avenues of uh, recourse to find out more about us, connect with us, and learn more about that. Um, so if anybody does want more information about that, I would encourage you to please connect with us via your preferred medium. And we will be happy to help and provide you with more detail. But without too much further ado, I'll throw it back to Tanya and she will introduce our guest speaker for this session. Thank you, Tanya. Thanks, Michael. So as I'm sure all of you are aware, we have the wonderful Guy St. Clair joining us today. Uh, I'm sure you can see his uh, webinar, his video. <laughs> So Guy, as I'm sure you all know, is a former SLA um, president, and he is the 2019 winner of the SLA John Cotton Dana Award, um, which we are very proud that he was able to receive that. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Guy, jump in here. Here I am. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Michael, and uh, to all my friends and colleagues at uh, Sutron Global. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I thank you for being with us today. I'm very grateful that we're all here together for this webinar. I think some of you already know me and know how much I like talking about knowledge services, which is what we'll be doing today and on March 16th. Now, for those of you new to the topic, knowledge services is the management methodology, discipline, the approach, some of us call it, we use to ensure that all the information, knowledge, and learning we have to deal with in our everyday lives can be done as well as possible. And today, we also want to think a little about how knowledge services can help us as we work with our organizations in our pandemic recovery efforts. So a very sincere thank you to Tony Sadat and the Sutron Global team for this opportunity. Our two businesses, Sutron Global and SMR International, have had a very successful rela uh, relationship, very successful strategic alliance since 2006, and we've done some really good work. Uh, we're very proud of what we've accomplished, and that good relationship and friendship reminds me of a situation we found ourselves in a long time ago. When someone came up to Tony and me after one of our presentations, and ask quite challengingly, what are you guys trying to do? Change the world? We got it. 
We responded immediately and simultaneously with a resounding yes. So perhaps this is the time to change the world. Time to acknowledge the crisis we're all experiencing and all of us hoping it will soon come to an end before too long. And to figure out just what we're going to do when the pandemic is over. Um, I'm going to have to stop and ask, it seems that the, the uh, slides are on a timer and we need to put them on manual because otherwise they're going ahead uh, way too far. I'm sorry about that. Um, so perhaps the time, it is time to come to change the world. I've already mentioned about that and we're all hoping it'll come to an end before too long. Many people have opinions just like I do and I'm especially taken with some of them. For example, former Pre Vice President Al Gore described his hope for our future very well in a recent article I'm going to see if I can slide, and I want you to see this because as we talk about it, I want you to see what he describes as his hope for our future. He did this in a recent article, and here on the slide is what he said. Now, my list is not quite as thorough as his, and I have my concerns in a slightly different order, but I think we're moving in the same direction. In my opinion, we can't do anything until we get the pandemic under control. But that doesn't mean I would advocate not giving attention to the other issues. And as information professionals, knowledge services professionals, it's our responsibility to start at the top of the list. The slide there. It's a scary list. Yet at the same time, Vice President Gore builds on, as Americans have been doing for more than 200 years, the idea of opportunity and what we Americans can do. He writes about the new beginning we've been given at a rare moment, he calls it, when as a society we might be able to break the stranglehold by what we choose to do with a new vision. Now it's up to us to identify and build on that new vision. And of course, if you know me, you know I had to give it a try. So here are a few thoughts from an article I wrote recently, published just about a week ago, in a German magazine called De Greuter Conversations. And if you don't read German, don't worry, the article is in English. The article is called How Knowledge Services Catalyzes Post-Pandemic Recovery. And if you look me up on LinkedIn, this is the first thing you'll see. So how do we realize the hope that Gore has embraced? How do we do it? Well, I go a little further. Here are some of the topics that I think about, topics that, to my way of thinking, are what we need to be giving attention to. We're going to look at a wide range of opportunities. We start, of course, with opportunity number one. And for our first and ultimately, probably our most important opportunity for these thoughts about opportunity, we must be ready for when the pandemic is finished, or at least for when it is at a stage at which social interactions can begin again. When we recognize that goodwill exists in humankind and it must be taken advantage of. Our second opportunity has to be our determination. There's no question that where we are now is unlike any other time in history, certainly not in our own lifetime. And yes, we have this opportunity. We can start again because we are determined. And this business of being in the right place at the right time, we got through 9-11, didn't we? We're going to get through this. Next, we think about open conversation. If we're really smart, we'll be thinking in terms of collaboration, of how knowledge services is essentially predicated, predicated on collaboration. When we think like that, we're already ahead of the game. And yes, we have to think about what our strength of purpose is. When the time comes, we can use knowledge services to build a better society, including a better workplace. Why? We know we can do it. 
we will have come through the pandemic and we will be moving to where we will be when it's finished. And when it's finished, that'll show us our strength of purpose. We won't need anyone to push us to action. We'll be ready. And finally, as important as anything we're thinking about has to do with moving to a new state of being. We will be identifying and embracing a new state of being. And that, it has, that has some pretty serious obligations for us, for our work as information professionals and as knowledge services professionals. So now you'll have to decide how you will embrace the challenge you've been given. From where I sit, here are a few things to think about. What's your own vision of your work and of your profession after COVID-19? Are there successful or exemplary practices you've heard about or participated in? And how can you put them to work in your organization? And quite simply, doing your job better. So these are some of the topics we will soon, uh, we'll, we'll, that will be some of what we'll talk about today and when we meet in March, because I firmly believe once the vaccinations go to work and we've prepared ourselves, we can and we will move forward to where we want to be. Will it be what we're hearing so much, the new normal? Nah, I don't think so. I don't think we can go back to what was formerly formerly thought of as normal. So perhaps it could be better put just to say the next, as my friend Marsha Stepanek, who's the author of one of the upcoming books in the series I edit, Marsha puts it this way. She says it's the next. Or as I think I heard Richard Holzer say in a recent presentation in this Sutron series, the new next using the term Microsoft has been using a lot recently, it makes a lot of sense. But I think the best is the title of an informal newspaper now being published in New York's Greenwich Village. It's called The New Now, and I think it works best for what we're looking for. If we're going to describe what we'll be doing when the pandemic is finished. And here's what we need to be thinking about what we want to focus on. We want to make sure that we're emphasizing knowledge. So let's go with the idea that I shared earlier. Let's change the world. Let's move forward into the new now, now, and let's find the tool that will help us as information professionals and as knowledge services professionals, help us help our organizations deal with the new age, we'll be working in when the virus is conquered. Let's give some thought to what we can do to make our workplace, the organizations where we work, or any other group or community we're working with, better at sharing information, knowledge, and learning. And no matter what we call ourselves, information pros, librarians, specialist librarians, archivists, information managers, research specialists, it doesn't matter what we're called. Some of us, of course, call ourselves info pros or information professionals. And some of us connect our work with our education if our graduate degrees are LIS degrees, library and information science degrees, with information science being defined by ASSIST, the Association for Information Science and Technology you see here. But some of us, Think about it very differently. For me, the key word in that definition is knowledge. And you're not surprised to hear that. You know from the announcements about our program today that I think of what we're doing is, I think of it as knowledge services. It's what I'm talking about today. It's what we'll be talking about next month. Why? Because all of what we do, all of us involved in the programs, the activities and the professions I've just mentioned are in this game to ensure that people, that's all people, can develop the knowledge they need for whatever they want to do, no matter whether it's in business or for something else, that they can then share the knowledge they've developed and that they and the people they develop it with and share it with can put that knowledge to use. 
And so that's the process I call knowledge services. It's this approach to knowledge sharing I've been working with for a long, long time, somewhere between 20 and 30 years, I think. And while the more formal name is knowledge services, in order to distinguish this practice or discipline from knowledge management, we've even over the years come up with an acronym for what we do. Everybody knows how much we Americans love our acronyms. Many times when we're speaking about knowledge services, we also say KD, KS, KU, using our own little abbreviation for knowledge services, knowledge development, knowledge sharing, and knowledge use or utilization. And it all came together back in the late 80s and the 1990s and all our business when all our business and management attempts we were trying to figure out what to do with all the information knowledge and learning we had to deal with and that's shown here with what tom stewart was speaking about so presciently in 1997 and i think even a lot sooner because i'm remembering it was as early as around 1991 we had his famous fortune magazine article in it, Stewart actually pioneered the field of intellectual capital, leading many of us to think in terms of what later became knowledge management, or KM. Now that led me, in a story I can tell on another time because I've written about it pretty often, that led me to think about how we could reshape KM to be knowledge services. The management metho methodology, the discipline, that approach I called it earlier, we're talking about now for enabling us to do our best with knowledge sharing in whatever situation calls for it. Thinking along these lines leads us to what I think of as a primary characteristic or attribute of knowledge services. That it is, yes, a process or an approach to knowledge sharing. But it's more than that. It's what I think of as a humanistic approach, looking back to a more inclusive way of doing something. For one thing, it's a way of thinking that views us as human beings and in our development as individuals with, at the same time, a concern about how we as members of society think about ourselves and others in relation to the larger world or society. And both Lilienthal and Drucker got it right. What we do with knowledge services is to think about our work and our interactions as dealing with people, not with techniques and not with procedures. It's our calling to work with others to help them realize their goals. So it's no wonder Peter Drucker is referred to as the father of modern management. Everything we do with knowledge sharing has to do with engagement. It's about human beings and people's engagement with others is what we expect and what matters. Now, if Lilienthal and, and Drucker might seem a little dated to you, after all, their work was a long time ago, there's a more up-to-date perspective from Dove Seidman. Knowledge services is about how we work together and share what we know. With knowledge services, we look for things like behavior, trust, personal relationships, and it becomes pretty obvious that the success of any knowledge sharing activity we take on, whether in the workplace or in any other situation, is going to fall naturally into a successful and affirming sharing experience. And it's not just, it's not just management. It also has to do with leadership. Indeed, it's about what those in the field call transformational leadership. Because, sorry, because knowledge services doesn't require only a new way, a way of thinking about management, the leadership focus changes also, stretches, we might want to think of it, requiring a certain type of leadership from us as knowledge workers or knowledge services professionals. With Deb Hunt, for example, my wonderful good friend and colleague, and another one, a recent speaker at one of these programs, knowledge services leadership is characterized as service. 
not the subservient kind of service, but seeing knowledge sharing as giving other people an example of good leadership that in and of itself provides knowledge sharing success. Frances Hasselbein too, so well respected that she's referred to as the Dean of, of Leadership Development in America, Frances has her own long list of what she calls her milestones for transforming an ordinary knowledge sharing situation to one resulting in nothing less than excellence in knowledge sharing. And since we all agree, as we see in here in the upper left-hand side, since we all agree with Margaret Wheatley that people want to belong to and feel part of a community, Kevin Mangan's approach to knowledge leadership makes it clear that knowledge professionals know what to do. They know what is expected of them as they convince others who are in the community with them that their work might be to indeed reconceptualize, transform, and support new ways of working with knowledge sharing so that everyone benefits from successful KD, KS, KU. And what it comes down to, what it comes down to, what we're talking about with knowledge services is what people like John Hovell and David Gertine are working with. They call it conversational leadership. They encourage us to understand that leadership is a group sport, not top down the leader is always in charge sort of thing. They recommend thinking about this activity as conversational leadership that we consider using a new phrase and think of it as conversational community ship, bringing the whole idea of community into the picture. In doing so, Hovell and Gertine encourage us in these conversations within our community to ask these three core questions shown here on the slide. Are we having the conversation we need to be having right now? Are we having it in the way we need to be having it? And in what ways are we forming community with this conversation? And with those questions we ask, a metaphor that I like a lot, are we lighting the way to move into a future when people come together to achieve mutually agreed upon goals? Is this the new approach to knowledge sharing leadership we need? I think it is. To me, and I've been doing knowledge services, as I've said already, I've been doing it for a long time. But to me, this is the first, this is perhaps the first true connection of knowledge services with another discipline that brings together all these elements to make for successful knowledge sharing. And I feel so strongly about this new approach that I, I, I about this new way of connecting knowledge services with another discipline as we like to think about it. I'll include the information on this side to help you consider how you too can learn more about conversational leadership, about community ship. This is a program I urge you to look into. I'll be there, I can tell you. It's online and I wouldn't miss it. So now we're going to look at what my friends refer to as Guy's snail side, a schematic which, despite its movement layout, is really very simple to explain and to understand uh, as we try to work with information, knowledge, and what we know and how to put them to work in our lives. We'll begin by talking about what knowledge services is over here on the left in the blue circle. We see three elements of the process of the approach to knowledge sharing, information management, knowledge management, strategic learning. They all converge to become knowledge services. And here might be a good place to talk about why we say knowledge services is using the singular verb. That's because the phrase is made up of two words in what we call a compound noun. So we generally say knowledge services as if it were a single word. When we speak about it saying knowledge services is, knowledge services does, knowledge services has, etc. Now, as we follow the snail's green arrow, 
the results of good knowledge services come into play. Things like better research methodologies, speeded up innovation, decisions made in context and not just up in the air because they sound good. And as important as anything else, successful knowledge asset management, taking into account all of the different kinds of knowledge assets that exist in any workplace, any group, any organization, any time people come together working to achieve that agreed upon goal. And as we follow up in these brown ovals with some of the characteristics or attributes of the process, I think it will become familiar to you. On the right are the people who work with knowledge, perhaps some of you. These are the knowledge services people. We are there. We're strategic knowledge professionals. We're knowledge facilitator. We're the knowledge consultant, knowledge thought leader, knowledge strategist. We're all of these things. And as we look a little bit over, the, over to the left, we see some of the approaches that have been taken to knowledge services and that are now have now come to fruition. For example, at first, it was all about being reactive. We waited till someone came into our office, say, Mr. Guy, you're Mr. Knowledge Services. Can you tell me how to fix this, how to find this, how to do this? That transition to a more reactive uh, uh, pattern when, we, when knowledge services as a discipline became more sophisticated. And then look what happened. We got to where we are today. Knowledge services practiced today in our own age is interactive and integrated in the overall, into the overall work of the larger organization. Essential, critical to how the organization succeeds. Okay, I promise to give you some advice, some practical advice today, and I hope what you've heard already has been helpful. Now, in consideration of our limited time left, I'll share the following three questions. Uh, I'll, I'll share three questions with you and ask you to think about them so we can start out with these on March 16th. We'll start out with them because I want, us, I want to get into these things. For example, the first question has to do with when your employing organization moves into the post-pandemic pandemic stage, are you as the knowledge services leader prepared and willing to be the organization's leader in the management of, of the organization's intellectual capital. Now let's look at a, a, a second challenge. The question here is, what is your organization's greatest challenge in terms of its, or its knowledge culture? What do you think about it? How's it going to work? And then, we could look at the third piece of critical advice, practical advice that we'll be talking about. And there, there, there are four boxes here. We're not gonna talk about them now because we'll do them when we come together in March. But as we close, get close to closing today's program, I would like to pick up on that idea of the very last one, where we ask, think about younger people in the organization or the group or the community. Do they share understanding about information, knowledge, and strategic learning? Do they require encouragement? Are you the guide, mentor, knowledge leader these younger people are looking for? Well, as we move forward, I want to thank you, I want to introduce you to, although everybody in the country, everybody in the world knows about her now, I want you to meet Guy's new favorite person. And while this note is not quite in tune with what she was reciting on January 20th. Those of us so looking forward to working with our organization in its post-pandemic recovery, we can truly appreciate what Amanda Gorman has to say for us. It's a quotation from her, and as I say, Guy's new favorite person. Oh, how I'd love to meet her and introduce her to my children and my grandchildren. Amanda Gordon, she's the nation's first ever youth poet laureate. She wrote, read her poem, The Hill We Climb, during the inauguration of President Biden on January 20th. These lines resonate with us, with knowledge services professionals, as we strive to help our organizations deal with their professional objectives as the pandemic finishes. And as we think about what comes next, when the pandemic is finished, and we knowledge strategists are moving forward with a new approach to knowledge sharing. Can we afford 
to listen to or to follow the advice of those who want to want to take our intellectual state back to where it was no we can't let that happen as knowledge sharing professionals knowledge services information professionals whatever we call ourselves as knowledge services professionals we must arrive at that new state of being we will not amanda says we will not march back to what was but move to what shall be is there any better inspiration we can have to get us on track as knowledge services professionals for posi for positioning ourselves for leading our organizations into a better place that new state of being i referred to in my article in the german magazine so now at the risk yeah i tend to be a little bit uh, self-serving from time to time people do ask guy what do you do uh, 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 do you have several jobs so uh, do you write etc cetera, etc cetera. okay here's a slide with stuff about guy guy probably more than you ever need to know but it's there and uh, if you're interested you can look all this stuff up and and in fact as i say thank you you can contact me at our our website uh, our address in new york or you can get, get in touch with me either at my email at, at SMR or at my university email at Columbia, or you can call me by telephone. I'd love to hear from you. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Tanya and Michael and Tony. I'm all finished. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. And thank you for talking to us, Guy. We certainly appreciate that and the, uh, the, the benefit of your wisdom and experience there. Very interesting. Um, if anybody in the audience does have a question for Guy on anything that we've covered there or perhaps something different, um, there is a questions um, option to, generally to the right side of your screen. Um, so we, we, we'll have some questions coming through. Um, just to kick things off, Guy, here's one that has come through. I think inspired by that wonderful newspaper title, The New Now. Um, how do we get buy-in? from senior management if no one at that level was interested interested in our work in the old then we get them interested we don't we we don't wait for them to come to us we get them interested i said earlier we're interactive we we got to get out in the organization and it may mean identifying someone to be our sponsor with some of these more senior people who are not interested uh, because what we have to do is we have to figure out who like us understands knowledge services understands what's going on with knowledge management and information management strategic learning and how we can influence them uh, uh, to then move forward to influence other people it's what i think of as high-end knowledge sharing and it benefits the larger organization we have to come up with very tangible ways to explain to remember senior management's job is to control resources understand what incomes coming in what incomes going out and uh how to keep control of all of that they leave it up to people like us to understand knowledge services so what we have to do is put it in terms in their language that they understand and that's how we'll get the buy-in that's how it will make a difference thank you Michael. Okay. No, thank you, Guy. Thank you. U useful information. Um, somebody else has just come through and asked me, um, why why, should, why is knowledge sharing considered an asset in any organization? <laughs> um, shouldn't what a person knows be private? And uh, why, why, in your view, should it be shared? Well, first of all, unless it's um, proprietary or secure <laughs> uh, or, or having to do with security or something like that, our how do you say this without sounding like a like <laughs> murky we're working in this organization and our loyalty is to this organization it's not my information it's not my learning it's not my my uh, 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 knowledge it's what i got as part of my job and i have a loyalty to the organization that's paying my salary whether i get along with everybody or not is another thing but so it's not a matter of privacy or keeping information, knowledge or learning away from other people. 
but to figure out how it benefits everyone. And if in, and I ran into this with a, a an organization uh, that I was working with, that there were five divisions and four divisions came along with knowledge sharing, knowledge services. They bought into it. There was one division that would not, and I went into private meetings with the director of all of the division, et cetera, et cetera, until finally I said, tell me what you're most concerned about. And he talked about how we save money. We spend too much money and your knowledge managers, your knowledge service professionals can't tell me how we save money. Well, within a day, my team and I had come up with from their own answers. We had interviewed people and we come up with their own answers of how they save money. So what we have to do, it doesn't matter whether it's a business or a workplace, uh, it could be a nonprofit or a not-for-profit, it could be a volunteer organization. We're put on the spot sometimes to say, can you tell me why we have to share information? Why can't it be private? It can't be private. It doesn't belong to me or to the knowledge services professional it belongs to the organization. And as I say, unless it has to do with security uh, or something like that, or proprietary information, I mean, we're not gonna give out the formulas for the, 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 the products we make or the pills we make, that sort of thing. But we, it belongs to the organization and that has to be taken into consideration. Um, is that a fair answer? I'm not sure. <laughs> I think so. I think so, and it, it ties back to what you were you know, on the previous question about senior management and their um, their interest in um, you know, managing resources and, and knowledge is, is is one of the most important and vital resources an, any organisation can have in some cases. So um, I think it's very very um, very apt um, response there. Thank you, Guy. Um, and I think Guy, I think that we're all we're all done with those questions. So. Um, yeah, very, very interesting talk and very much looking forward to the next one uh, in a month's time. You will be, yes. uh, the audience will be receiving details on how to join us for that. But um, thank today, you, Guy. I'll just, hand it back. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll just hand back to Tanya at this point and um, Tanya can talk to, talk to um, how people can connect with us. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Well, so as everybody has already said, um, Guy is going to be putting on another session on March 16th. So uh, you can check out our events page to um, register for that already. We'll also be posting all of the links on our social media, which you can click on directly from the PDF um, when you get it. Uh, you can also check the recording on our YouTube channel, um, which we'll be posting uh, this entire series on. So uh, feel free to let us know. If, if we've missed anything and you want to send us an email, um, you can email us at info at sutronglobal.com or of course you can email Guy directly. Uh, but if there's anything you need, don't hesitate to visit sutronglobal.com for our uh, knowledge services blogs, news, and of course the events of where you can register for the next upcoming events. So thank you everyone for attending. We really appreciate you being here. Uh, take care and we'll see you on March 16th. Thank you. Bye.